Uh, good morning and welcome everybody to the second meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015. Can I remind all those present that electronic devices should be switched off? Uh, can I begin by welcoming Siobhan McMahon to the committee uh, as a new member? Uh, and also can I welcome Ian Gray, who's here as a uh, member but not a member of the committee. So welcome Ian uh, to the committee. Uh, obviously in our absence uh, at our last meeting, uh, Siobhan was elected as Deputy Convener and I also want to congratulate her on the record uh, for that post. But can I invite Siobhan to declare any relevant registrable interests? Thank you, Convener. I don't have anything to declare. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, our second item is to consider whether to take item five in private. This is to discuss a letter from Claire Baker, MSP, uh, a possible suggestion on the work programme uh, about the V&A Museum in Dundee. Do members wish to take that item in private? Yes. yes. Okay, agreed. Our next item is to consider Petition 1470 from the Scottish Youth Parliament. Um, as, as members will see from the paper, the petitioner is now content for the petition to be closed. Um, I think this is unique in my experience of a petitioner asking for a petition to be closed. However, it is up to committees to decide whether they wish to close a committee, or, uh, sorry, a petition or not. Uh, so therefore, can I invite the committee to consider what further action, if any, it wishes to take? Liam. Close the uh, close the petition, but put on record our, uh, uh, our, our congratulations on, on the outcome of the efforts. I think the petitioners have, have put in. Are members agreed to that? Agreed. Yes. Well, on, on behalf of the committee, I, I think I'd like to uh, reiterate what Liam said on uh, uh, the work that has been undertaken by the Scottish Youth Parliament and thank them for all their efforts in this area. Uh, but that petition is now closed. Uh, can I move on to item four on the agenda? Uh, our next item is to discuss the implications of a recent report on the resourcing of science in Scottish schools, uh, which was published by the Learned Societies Group on Scottish Science Education. Uh, the committee has previously agreed to undertake work on science, technology, engineering and maths, or STEM, as they're better known, and today's meeting is the first step uh, in that process. Can I welcome to the committee Professor Sally Brown, uh, Stuart Farmer, Dr Bill Beveridge, Dr Liz Lakin and Kate Farrell. Uh, can I thank you all very much for coming along and giving your time up to the committee this morning. Um, we've got about an hour to spend um, on this, hopefully. Uh, so I, I'm, without further ado, I'm just going to go straight to questions from members, if you don't mind. Um, quite happy for everybody to answer a question if they feel they've got something to contribute. But if somebody's already covered it, you don't need to repeat it. So thank you very much uh, for your uh, support this morning. Um, and can I ask members to indicate if they want to ask a question, and I know that Chick Brody wants to begin. Yes, if I may. Good morning. Um, I wonder, in, in the general context, I mean, some of the figures we've seen are quite heartening, but um, I just wonder, you know, on another committee, the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee, we had a, a problem in challenging young people to get involved in the engineering industry. I wonder what you can, if you can tell me what you are doing to attract more students into studying STEM products. Professor Brown. Well, we are very much <clears throat> supportive of the recent reforms in education. When I say recent, they've been going on for some years now. And therefore, anything that we do is to try and improve the situation with regard to the Curriculum for Excellence, uh, the role that that has to play, uh, for example, in um, primary education, uh, which is, I mean, in a sense, we're moving STEM subjects back into primary education, where although maths has been um, there consistently, um, the record in primary education for science has been uh, less encouraging. So we are, we are certainly doing that, and I'd like to ask um, Bill Beveridge to say something about that from the Royal Society of Chemistry, because they have a particular focus on starting everything at the, the primary level. We are concerned that um, we have some, as, as you know from the material that we've produced, produced for you, as well as the... Um, material on resources. We've also been looking for and carrying out some independent um, search for evidence about how things are going in schools. And there are certain things which um, are of concern, um, perhaps to us, but also, of course, to teachers and to schools themselves. For example, 
um, about the curriculum structure, uh, particularly um, the move from a 2-2-2 structure to a 3-3 structure, and the impact that this might have on people able to continue, being able to continue, when I say people, I mean pupils, being able to continue um, with, the, with what they need in order to gain entry to further education or higher education courses. And I think as a group, um, that's really um, the kind of general focus that we have. But maybe, I mean, I'll turn to Bill first, but maybe the others here could say something which is much more specific, which relates to their particular learned society in science. I wonder before we pass, I just want yes. to... One of the elements in the discussion that we had in the other committee was we talk about uh, those that are involved in, in, in the industry in, 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 uh, or in the sector. Invariably, nobody ever seemed to talk to the parents in depth about how attractive the, product, the, the STEM uh, 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 sector might be. I just wonder if in your answer, Dr. Beveridge, you can give some indication as to how much of the survey it was uh, applied to the consideration of parents as to whether or not they wanted their children to be involved in science or not. Uh, I mean, th these are excellent points uh, th th that you raise and um, very much uh, a, a matter that's it's the concern of all, our, all of our learning societies is very much promoting uh, to the entire community, not just school pupils, but parents um, and grandparents uh, and the whole of society that the important role that these STEM subjects play. Uh, and you asked in your, uh, in your question, what is it you know, that we, we are doing to kind of promote these subjects? And each of our, our organisations will have different programmes. Uh, we have, the Royal Society of Chemistry has a programme called Chemistry at Work. And Chemistry at Work um, brings in people who use chemistry in their everyday um, employment into schools, into secondary schools, and very importantly into primary schools as well, to showcase what it is that chemists do. And the important thing there is that these chemists won't just work in things like the petrochemical industry, uh, but with people from the fire service coming along, or people from the food industry or the textiles industry. And we, we see that as being very, very important. Um, but as, as Sally's mentioned, um, one of the most uh, important things uh, for us at the moment is primary um, because at these very, very early stages of a child's career, the evidence is overwhelming that the attitudes that you're forming at, the, at these early stages are attitudes that will, in many cases, let you know, be set for, for life. But these, forgive me, these yes. attitudes can be disabused by parents who take a, perhaps a different view of, 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 the, of that particular sector. Is that not the case? Uh, it's, it, you're absolutely, uh, again, you're absolutely right. And um, in other programmes that, that um, our, our societies operate, and so again, speaking for the Royal Society of Chemistry, one of the things that we're looking at funding this year in Scotland is an initiative to take um, uh, the message out to communities and rural communities in particular, uh, and more remote rural communities, um, showcasing the important role that chemistry plays in other STEM subjects. And in that uh, pilot, we're looking at not just speaking to traditional audiences that we speak to, such as school pupils, but the families and the parents and the grandparents, because you are right, um, the attitudes in the home are crucial. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mark Griffin. Thank you, Kimia. Um, just a, a quick question on the, the report and the, um, the survey sample um, before I kick off. We had a members' debate in, in Parliament last week, and there was a a question around the survey sample and whether um, the figures in the report um, could really be used to analyse the picture across Scotland, although um, I think a survey of 12% of secondary schools is clearly isn't insignificant. Do you think there's a body of work here that the government could be doing um, to emulate the, uh, the work of the report um, to give a, a more um, accurate pos position of what's going on right across Scotland? I could start and then I'll hand over to, um, to Stuart. Um, one of the concerns that, of course, has led us to undertake this gathering of evidence has been that there hasn't been enough uh, gathering of independent evidence 
in relation to the reforms. And that's our, our first concern. Now, actually, a 12% or a 10% sample of schools is, I think you said, insignificant. No, not, I said it's not insignificant. Oh, not insignificant. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear the not. <laughs> I mean, it is really um, relatively significant, although that doesn't apply to the primary schools. We haven't done a 12%. If the panel had, had listened in to the debate or, or read the report of the debate, I think the question, and I, I myself raised that question, was uh, it was the primary schools that were being questioned. Not the, not the secondaries, but the 2% sample size in the, in the primary schools. No. Certainly the primary schools uh, was much lower. What I would have to say was that the findings actually were pretty much in line with what the individual societies had found in their own experience. But it is true that we don't have a large primary school packet of evidence available. But may I turn to Stuart and let him comment on this? Yes, the um, learner societies um, would like to see um, um, more uh, work done in this area. Um, essentially, the, the reason that the learning societies uh, decided to follow this up um, was as part of the, the SEAG report um, recommendations in 2012, uh, recommendations 411 to 413 was uh, precisely to do, as you suggested, that a proper uh, independent uh, study be done to identify uh, the resources required to adequately uh, deliver the uh, curriculum. Unfortunately, the, these were uh, some of the recommendations that in the, the government's response were, were rejected. However, the learning societies felt that there was a sufficient uh, issue here that um, they were able to devote a small amount of funding in order to do some independent uh, evidence gathering. Uh, we would have liked to have uh, done a sufficiently large study uh, to be able to present um, uh, findings with a statistical basis of 95% uh, confidence with a 5% error. However, on doing the analysis, that would have required us to have sampled over uh, around about 200 or more secondary schools in Scotland and a slightly greater number of uh, primary schools and the resources available to effectively what are charitable member, uh, member um, funded organisations was not sufficient to do that. However, we did um, attempt to uh, provide as representative a survey uh, sample as possible. Uh, we wanted to ensure that uh, as many local authorities were represented as possible and that uh, you know, large, small, rural, urban, island schools were all represented. The sample that we have got, particularly in secondary, uh, I have to admit, does have good representation from all of these groups. We ended up getting um, uh, a, a sort of statistical sample where the, the sort of error um, on 95% confidence is about 14%. Um, as you'll have seen from the figures, the, the outcome, um, if I can uh, use the secondary figures as, as a, a base, um, indicates that the um, funding um, from the, the sample schools of uh, an, for an average school within the sample of £5,590 per annum um, is about 19% of what we've uh, estimated to be a reasonable sum to maintain, uh, not to start from scratch, but to maintain the resourcing level in secondary schools. Um, with a 14% error, if you give the benefit of the doubt um, and increase the um, uh, amount by 14%, that still only increases um, the, the sums available to about 24% of that which we um, estimate. Um, the sample, as I say, is small. However, the, the findings from this sample does actually bear um, remarkable um, comparison with the previous study that was done uh, 2001 to 2003. Uh, while that was only done for physics departments in Scotland rather than um, in Scottish secondary schools rather than uh, all schools, uh, that was based on a sample of 120 schools across Scotland. In other words, more than 30% of all schools based the return. Uh, so I think the two studies together give an element of breadth and depth which give representative figures and also over an, an extended uh, time period. Um, 
I think, therefore, you know, we would strongly recommend that uh, consideration be given uh, to actually do further research and gain um, independent evidence of the real situation in in Scotland. I think the learned societies have done uh, as much as we were able to do in the, on the timescale and with the resources available to us. Okay, okay. Th thanks very much for that. Um, you, you touch on the, the the question of resources in your answer. Then you've given an estimated um, annual budget of just under twenty, uh, just under thirty thousand pounds for um, the average Scottish secondary school. Um, have you done any um, work as to what that would mean on a a Scotland-wide basis in terms of um, an increase in funding and any analysis of how that could possibly be met from local authority budgets or whether that would need to be supplemented by additional funding from central government? We haven't done any uh, analysis or, or any work on where that funding ought to uh, come from. We've done the, the um, uh, analysis in terms of what we estimate to be a reasonable sum uh, in order to, to deliver the, the curriculum based on evidence that um, historically started off by work that the Royal Society um, in London and ASE started um, about uh, 20 or more years ago and has been sort of updated in various steps since then. Um, we've, uh, I think, come up with a, a reasonable estimate, as I say, for uh, a care and maintenance budget uh, to reasonably deliver the curriculum. Reports in the, the press over the weekend have set that at a Scottish level of um, an additional £8 million pounds, um, annually. Do you think that's an accurate reflection of um, what you're suggesting in your report? I think that's reasonable, yes. OK, thanks. Um, the, the, the last question I wanted to ask was um, on comparisons in your report between spending in other parts of the UK and, the, and Scotland. Can I, can I sort of some members who want supplementaries on that area before you move on or bring, come, yep. back, come back to you. Thanks. Uh, Gordon MacDonald first. Yeah, thanks very much, Kim. You know, it was just when Mark talked about the sample size, um, you know, I've got a couple of questions about primary come up later on, and I, I just thought it would maybe be appropriate at the moment just to find out, to put it in context, your findings. Um, how was this, how, uh, particularly about primary, how was the, the sample, sam what was the size of the sample? Um, that was originally identified, what was the response rate from primary schools? And was it self-selecting? You know, did schools decide whether to opt in or not, or did you invite them? And how, how was the sample put together? The, the uh, sample, um, we tried to identify name contacts within schools, uh, within um, learned society contacts, uh, and the initial... Um, sample uh, was by invitation, but at the same time we put out a general invitation to um, the, the education um, you know, sector in general uh, and invited people to respond. Um, the um, the, the um, consultancy firm that uh, did the research then analysed uh, the sample that we got where we got full and adequate uh, responses. We, we got partial responses from some. Um, uh, inevitably with such surveys, um, no matter how well we try and design a survey, we don't always get um, a full completion rate that we would have liked. But there was, if my understanding is correct, there was 39 primary schools that took part in the survey. Yes. Um, how many people, how many primary schools did you invite to take part in that survey? Um, we, we invited, I, I can't give you an exact number off the top of my head, but slightly more than that, plus we made a, a, a general um, uh, invitation um, more widely through networks um, so that there, there was an open um, invitation to, to contribute as well as for those that we um, identified um, with name contacts, which was somewhere in excess of 50, but I can't remember the yeah. exact number off the, the top of my head. But given you had a general call to presumably all 32 local authorities, is, is the response rate disappointing then? We were slightly disappointed with the response, yes. We were hoping to get a, a full 50 um, fully completed. Right, okay, thanks. Can I go, uh, Colin? Thank you, Vera. Um, I'd like to come back to resources, which were touched on. Um, clearly, that's a, a key element of uh, the papers that have been submitted are there insufficient resources being allocated to, to these areas. 
And yet I look at tables uh, which show entrance to hires in selected subject, the passes to hires, the entrance to advanced hires, and the passes in advanced hires, and most of these figures are at record levels. I mean, between 2009 2014, which is the periods I'm looking at, we're seeing huge increases, both in the number of entrants and in the number of passes. What would, it, what would additional resources add to that? What sort of improvements would we see beyond what we're already seeing? Yeah, I think that what um, the learning societies are concerned uh, about, and this comes from um, communication with a, a wide variety of state ho stakeholders, uh, so all the, the learning societies, such as the Institute of Physics, Royal Society of Chemistry, have obviously got large um, industry and higher education representation, and there is um, you know, a consistent message of concern about the, the sort of practical um, practical investigative problem-solving skills that our young people are developing. And there's con <coughs> concern within the learning societies that too much of um, the practical science which is being reported to be done uh, in secondary schools and in primary schools, uh, I think particularly in secondary schools in this case, um, is where the teacher is demonstrating the experiments and so on to the class because there is a shortage of equipment, that there's one of something rather than having, say, 10 of a piece of equipment and allowing uh, pupils to do experiments themselves with a hands-on basis. And therefore, uh, I think there's concerns that while the basic knowledge um, of the science subjects, I think, is being uh, taught well. And I think that the figures uh, that you quote, you know, show that uh, lots of pupils uh, are seeing positive benefits from studying the science. But nevertheless, their ability to develop the, the hands-on uh, practical skills and the uh, deeper analytical skills that can be based on um, experimental work are not being as developed as fully as we would wish. Are you saying that uh, it's industry that is coming and saying that? There, um, there is um, information from industry, from higher education, uh, generally, um, you know, f from um, the, 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 the places that our young people in schools go on to uh, when they leave school. But surely industry has ways of feeding that back, not just through yourselves, but, uh, you know, there's many engagements between... Uh, between education and industry that would uh, receive that sort of feedback and, and take it into account. And surely that is part of what we're seeing here in terms of the outcomes. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a wee bit on this one. Well, I think we, we should repeat our concern that there hasn't been a significant amount of independent, systematic um, evidence gathering on this. And that certainly applies in relation to the connections that we have between industry and school education and higher education and so on. Now, of course, there are plenty of people who give opinions so that one can collect together one's own set of anecdotes, you know, in relation to this. But what comes continually from people who write about it and this is not systematic evidence, this is what we read about, is that you, you're probably all too young to remember the changes that were made in the 1960s when we went into the alternative science syllabuses. And there was quite an extraordinary change in the amount of practical work that young people did, which previously had just been something demonstrated by the teacher. Now, sadly, over the years, that practical work has diminished. And people give, I mean, I can give you anecdotal statements that people have made. Very often, teachers will say, well, of course, it's all the health and safety regulations, which actually I don't believe, although there may be some that is to do with health and safety. But there are a lot of reasons why we don't have as much practical work among young people now. And that is not good for our future. I mean, we do have every, every week on television and elsewhere, you see concerns expressed about the loss of practical skills. And these are in, in many different environments. But I think 
we have a lot, as I say, of anecdotal evidence, but we don't have systematic, and that's what we would actually want to have. But I wonder if I can... But, but isn't it a little bit uh, odd to be making assertions based on anecdotal evidence on what's been read about? That is there actually hard evidence to back up what you say? Well, we are trying to provide some evidence that approaches hard evidence, but our concern, our primary concern has been, and I've said this from the start of this meeting, that actually, as a country, we're not looking for systematic independent evidence in the way that we should be. So the answer to you is, we're very short of hard evidence. And we have perhaps the closest thing to it, but it's not enough. Okay. I wonder thank if you. I could ask Liz um, yes. uh, from the teacher education. Okay, yes, thank you. May I? I'm, I'm here representing um, the Society of Biology, um, but also I, I work at the University of Dundee in initial teacher education. And what has come through from the experience, particularly of the Society uh, of Biology, is that um, we have evidence from across the UK that students are coming into employment as well as into higher education, these are science students, without these skills, um, or fully developed those skills that um, Stuart was alluding to a moment ago. And that has prompted the society to develop an accreditation scheme, which is looking at university degrees so that students coming out of degrees actually have, um, have been developing these skills. Now, for us to be doing that... Um, has meant that we, there really is concern up and down the country that um, something needs to be done in, in, education, in school education to promote and develop these skills, and they go back to the practical work. They go back to students being able to um, assess the nature of science, the way science actually works, to look at the evidence that they're getting, and to be um, um, proactive and, uh, in, in what they're actually trying to do so that they can look at the quality of the evidence they have and they can say, yes, I need, I need to know, I know where I can go with this and I know what I can do with this. And they haven't got those skills at the moment. They don't seem to be coming out with them. And so, therefore, they need to be addressed a lot later on than perhaps they should be at, 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 at secondary schools. So there, there is the evidence available, but it's available across the country, not specifically um, from what we're talking about what? here. Thank you very much. I've got, I'll come back to you in a second, Dr. Beveridge. Uh, I've got three supplementaries, um, further supplementaries, before, and I inter rudely interrupted Mark earlier, and I want to come back to him, so I don't want to get stuck at this one question. So if you could have uh, three quick supplementaries from Liam, Mary, and then Ian, and then we'll move, come back to Mark. Thanks very much. Good morning. Um, I struck by the, the conversation again this morning about sample size in relation to the primary uh, sector, and, and the programme for government 2014-15 suggests that uh, the Minister will continue to support improvement in the learning and teaching of STEM in schools with particular focus on primary schools. Do you not find it astonishing that given that priority, um, that the focus should be on the small sample size in the survey you've conducted? rather than on some of the issues it's thrown up and a determination to get to the bottom of that uh, one way uh, or the other. And could I perhaps also uh, invite you, in following up uh, Colin Beattie's questions earlier, the statistics in terms of pass rates suggest that for a, a bit of a mixed bag, that on uh, passes and hires for biology and physics, um, they've gone down while others have gone up. And in advanced hire, um, certainly the, the, um, the, the pass rates uh, on chemistry have gone down, albeit that others have gone up. So a bit of a mixed bag. But actually the real issue thrown up by um, the survey you've, in, uh, you've conducted is that the problems that we're seeing in primary school now will actually only manifest themselves in the secondary sector in relation to hires and advanced hires, etc., in a number of tier, uh, years' time. In, in, in essence, there will be a lag effect to the, to the issues that your surveys have thrown up. Yes, and we are working, of course, very much in the context of the reforms of the last few years, which, as you know, have only just got to the point where we're moving into the hires and the advanced hires. And we'll have to see what impact it has. But there are big questions about whether the reforms that we've had, which of course have had um, support across all political parties and certainly have support from, from us, but whether they are being implemented, I mean, it's the implementation that is the question, whether they're being implemented in ways that are actually going to prepare young people better uh, not just for hires and advanced hires, but for the future of, of STEM in Scotland. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, Mary, 
Um, like Colin Beatty, uh, we were given a set of figures today, uh, and I was actually surprised that uh, there are an increasing number of students entering for hires and advanced hires. Uh, my expectation would be that it was going in the other direction. So if we take uh, this information... No, the direction in which it's going at the moment. Well, the, the trend that I have... There was a trend. Was a and between 2009... And 14. Yes, a historic. I, I mean, in some, I think, uh, information systems, there's a slight decline, but generally speaking, uh, it's increasing. So if I take that and then I look at the paper from you, and if I may read it out, uh, 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 convener, SQA presentation for 2014 qualifications indica indicate reduced numbers. Biology down 8.9, chemistry down 8.8, .8, physics down 5.6, computing related 20 down 22.4 and maths down 9.4. Now, I'm struggling to see all your figures are down and that's SQA presentations and yet all the figures we've got here and as a, an economist, I have looked at them very carefully. All the figures that I've got here are going in the opposite direction. So I'm trying to find, I'm trying to establish why I have two separate sets of figures here. You, yours are going in the wrong direction. The figures I have are, the trend is up. Dr Beveridge. Yes, this is a very pertinent po point. The figures for hire and advanced hire you're looking at are, of course, from 2014, and these were the non-curriculum for excellence, traditional, uh, old versions of these courses. Okay. Um, and the, these numbers over several years had shown a, a, a heartwarming uh, rise in the number of people doing the sciences. But the figures that are giving us uh, concern are the figures coming for the new curriculum for excellence courses, which, of course, have only reached in schools S4. Okay. Uh, and looking at these figures and trying to compare like with like across uh, Scottish qualification, sorry, the Scottish credit and qualification framework levels three, um, four and five, which equate to the old standard grade, um, we are concerned um, that uh, we are seeing decreases in all of the sciences. Uh, and uh, as, as you say, the figures are almost 9% for biology and chemistry and a little less the drop for uh, physics. Um, so you're picking that up now, so that explains why you're getting the early signals of a decline, of a change, yeah. yes. but our entrance from the past. So, in fact, you're both correct. <laughs> <laughs> you're both correct. Uh, my, my second question, convener, if I may, um, it seems to me that, you know, now that we understand this and obviously we'll look uh, more in depth at the alarming figures that, that you give, but what concerns me, uh, Professor Brown, you do say you're very supportive of CFE, and, I, and, and we all are, but we also all hear the stories from Wood Commission and, uh, and we've heard it from uh, Dr Lakin today about the hands-on skills. So is, is your concern mainly that you are having reduced numbers going forward uh, from the Curriculum for Excellence uh, new curriculum, or is your main concern that the qualifications that they're getting is not enough hands-on, not enough practical, and that you are, dare I say, a watered-down version of what used to be a science qualification and that uh, school pupils are no, long, no longer have the employment and higher education skills, no longer have the pra practical work has diminished, and the ability to develop hands-on skills have de diminished. So are you saying that we are no longer preparing them for the employability and higher education, as well as the declining numbers? Actually, I think our main concern is that what we need to try and ensure is that a reformed system, which we're working with now, actually produces the best that it can for the future. Well, we all want but, that. Yes, yeah. of course. But the decisions that were made to have no pilot work in these reforms have meant, together with the fact that we have no independent evaluations, we have no baseline data, it means that we really don't know what is going well and what is not going well and what we should do about it. But you are concerned at the quality of the practical experience and the ability of school pupils 
to pitch into employment and higher education, am I right? Indeed we are. But our concern is that we really understand what is going on at the moment. I mean, the sorts of things that you're suggesting that we should be con uh, concerned I'm about... I'm the questions. In the, I've, I'm not suggesting, I'm only asking questions on the basis of I, your evidence. The sorts of things implied by your questions, then, <laughs> <laughs> are that we should be concerned about the long term, and indeed we should. We also should be concerned about such things as whether the SQA assessments and qualifications are actually doing what we need to do in order to ensure that the Curriculum for Excellence is achieving the things that it's set out to do. So that's our concern as a group of, of royal societies. Now, what you... I mean, you have to think about what you're going to put your efforts into. And it certainly seems to me that the kinds of things we've brought to your attention, both about resources and about uh, such things as the confidence that primary teachers have in their ability to do what is needed, we need to do some work on that, and that's what we have focused on. What we haven't got to yet is a sort of set of recommendations that we would bark at you during this, this meeting to say what ought to be done. I mean, if you take, for example, and you've, you've shown that you're concerned about it, uh, the responsibility for who does something about funding better resources and how it should go, then we have to say, well, central government, of course, has responsibility, and it tells us that actually all of this is devolved to regional authorities, and regional authorities tell us that almost all of the money for education, 80 or 90 percent, is actually devolved to schools. And then we go and ask the schools, and the schools say, well, actually, 90% of what we spend is spent on teachers, and we have absolutely no control over that. We have to pay what the national scales are. And some say, and even on procurement, we have to obey the decisions that have already been made. So, no, we don't have any freedom to speak of to take on that responsibility. Now... We're not here to tell you how that should be done. We're simply here to say that that's something that has to be given attention, whether it's by central government or by local government. And all we can do is to offer the evidence that we have and say it would be a very good thing if more extensive, more overall evidence was actually commissioned. So I think you have to see the position that we are coming from. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Professor Brown, uh, Ian Gray. Um, it, was, it was on the point of the, the quality of data and evidence mm. uh, that's available mm. that I, I wanted to follow up, although in some ways the discussion's moved on a little bit. And that's been a theme of the questioning, and I think that's not surprising because um, the data available is a bit of a theme of the submission that the, the, the LSG have made. Um, you, you talked, I think it was Stuart, about SEAG and the recommendations they had made about tracking progress in STEM subjects and how those recommendations had not been accepted. And the, the submission talks about, for example, the establishment and vacancy statistics uh, ending, so there's no information on teacher vacancies, um, a lack of information on the level of science qualification of primary teachers, whether they have hires, for example, in a science or math subject. And then also the withdrawal of Scotland from Tim's and Pearl's the international comparisons. So, uh, my question really is this. You've, you've talked a lot about the data that's available. Um, is it fair to say that when it comes to both inputs and outputs, actually the data available is reducing, that this is not getting better, it's actually getting worse, and we know less about what's happening in science teaching in our schools, uh, and that's why you've tried to plug that gap with your survey? Yes, I think I would agree with that. I mean, if you make a... I've already made a comparison with the changes that with the reforms we went through in the 60s. Yep. Let me shift up to the 80s, to the reforms to standard grade, where 
there was very much more concern about pilot studies and about continuing professional development, which happened before and as the reforms were being introduced, not as a kind of afterthought after difficulties were identified by teachers. We have a problem with not having the right data. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe I should turn to, to Kate, who's from Computing Science. Computing Science, we are all agreed, is absolutely centrally support, important in ways that it used not to be. And we have concerns about both the number of teachers of computing science, the distinction between ICT, which is quite often readily taken on, but computational thinking, which we think is absolutely essential for the future of our society, but we also have difficulty in getting data that we need. So, Chair, may I ask Kate to contribute to this? Please. Um, so um, we've carried out two surveys um, this year and two years ago. Um, this year we've discovered we've lost 109 computing teachers over the last two years. So we're now down to about 650 computing teachers in Scotland for secondary. Um, that equates to a 14% drop. The, the, in the five years before that, um, we lost 100 teachers. So we, we've, we've had a drop of 100 teachers over five years, and then we've had another 109 teachers over the last two years. Um, that's now meaning that 12% of our secondary schools in Scotland don't have a, a computing teacher at all. Um, when we ask schools why they don't have a computing teacher or how they're teaching the curriculum um, if they don't have a computing teacher, many of those uh, respondents were confused between the difference between ICT and computing. So they were saying, oh, we're teaching ICT across the curriculum. So yes, um, ICT should be taught across the curriculum, um, but that's, that's how to use the technology. That's, that's technology within teaching. That's how to use iPads or phones or laptops or whatever. Um, we're concerned that um, we're not teaching how to program those devices. We're not teaching how they work. We're not teaching um, computational thinking, the core skills of um, understanding processes and methods and, and modelling. Um, in terms of the, the numbers staying relatively static, um, we've been f hit fairly hard in the changes from uh, standard grades to national five. So in standard grades, pupils were generally taking seven or eight standard grades. Now with national fives, they're generally taking five national fives, maybe six. So that reduces their, their subject choices down. So their column choices are generally sort of maths, English, um, a modern language, uh, science. And then there's a kind of column of everything else. And computing science, although it's a rigorous academic subject, is generally bum bundled in with practical subjects such as... Um, well, in my school, we, we were competing with uh, cake decorating and car mechanics, which are valid subjects, but they're, they're not rigorous academic subjects and they're not scientific subjects. Um, we're finding that there's a, a lack of computing teachers in the system. We're not getting enough computing teachers being trained up, which is one of our problems. Um, so uh, 10 out of 32 local authorities were saying they were having problems recruiting computing teachers. Um, we only have uh, teacher training happening in Glasgow as a city now. So Glasgow and Strathclyde are offering PGDEs in computing. Um, and they're only, we're not reaching our targets. So this year, 21 teachers, there's 21 student teachers training as computing teachers, plus two at, S at Stirling each year. Um, and that's not reaching our target. It's not even reaching the, the sort of extended cap that the, the universities were allowed to, to reach. Um, so we're not getting enough teachers into the system, which is then causing problems with recruitment. Um, in terms of um, those numbers, so we, each year we're staying relatively steady, steady for, for higher computing has, so far. But we're not, we need to train a massive numbers more teachers because we need more. Uh, Scotland IS, our industry body for Scotland in, for IT, is saying we need to train up more computing teachers. We need to train up more uh, people in computing and get through university so that we get more people into the IT industry. 
if we can get tens of thousands more into our industry, then our economy can boom. But at the moment, we don't have enough people coming through to meet the demands of the industry. Um, they're carrying out an annual survey at this, uh, um, over this month. Um, last year's annual survey was saying that 70% of respondents um, to, that, to that industry survey were planning on recruiting, but couldn't get, were struggling to get staff or came to go out with, out with Scotland to get uh, new members of staff. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Is it a very brief supplementary? Maybe. Yeah. If I may ask, again, go back to the other committee I'm on. We've been investigating the uh, creative industries and, and yeah. the video industry. Yeah. And, you know, here we have a sexy industry, <clears throat> and yet you can't recruit uh, those that are needed to support that. Yeah. And I come back to my original question about, you know, where does the responsibility lie? How much responsibility do you have, or not you personally, but the, but, but the, the societies and, and <coughs> etc. in attracting people who are quite clearly there's a huge industry, very attractive, yeah. hugely important to the, and, and yet you're raising your hand saying, well, what are we doing? What, what's government doing about it? What are you well, doing about it? Well, Computing at Schools Scotland are working with Skills Development Scotland. Um, who are planning a publicity campaign. So that's a core part of their um, skills investment plan for IT. So we're working with them on that. Um, in terms of increasing demand and increasing skills, um, we've had government funding um, a couple of years ago that's a part of a project called Professional Learning and Networking for Computing, Plan C, where we're providing um, CPD and networking and support for computing teachers. So there's only 650 computing teachers, and we're working with over 50% of those, them already um, on upskilling um, and learning new pedagogies for teaching computing. Um, we've not had any professional development generally as a, a nation since the 80s when a lot of teachers were converted over into teaching computing. Um, as a nation, we're very rare internationally, so um, we're one of the few countries in the world where we're, we ask our computing teachers to have a degree in computing, and we've had that for a long time now. Um, we're one of the few um, nations that um, provide teacher training and, and train teachers in computing, and we're one of the few countries in the world who have a, a curriculum for computing in primary level. Um, and I, I really hope we don't squander that and hope we build on that. Um, because we have a lot of countries looking at us in envy at the moment. OK, thank you. Stuart. Uh, follow up on uh, the points that Kate has made. Um, I think that all the, the learning societies here are uh, doing quite a lot on various initiatives. Uh, Bill spoke about some earlier on to try and recruit young people um, into STEM subjects, but also to recruit teachers um, into uh, subjects. Um, an example at the moment, the Institute of Physics, for example, are um, in the process of putting together a campaign uh, for um, physics and uh, suitable undergraduates to enter the teaching profession to try and address the, the issues of uh, teacher shortage. Um, uh, Although I am here today representing the Association for Science Education and the Institute of Physics, um, I also uh, sit on the STEMEC, the STEM uh, Education Committee, um, that are following on uh, from the, the, the CIAG uh, Committee um, that I mentioned in the report earlier. Um, the supply of um, an adequate number of teachers is something that's concerned the uh, STEMEC. Uh, we had a meeting last year with uh, John Gunston from uh, the, the Teacher Workforce Planning um, of the Scottish Government. Uh, and the figures for 2012-2013 showed that the actual target intake um, for computer science teaching uh, PGDE was 42, but the actual intake um, that was achieved was only 17. Uh, obviously a shortfall of 25. Um, that gives a replenishment rate uh, of about 2.8%. So in other words, at the rate um, that um, PGDE students uh, were um, being trained, it would take 36 years to replenish the existing workforce, which, as Kate said, uh, I think is insufficient. There are schools that don't have a computing science teacher at all. And um, the four subjects with the lowest replenishment rates um, 
are computer science, physics, chemistry and business studies. Uh, and um, the Institute of Physics is, uh, as I said, uh, very concerned that we do not um, go down the route um, in Scotland that we see, for example, uh, in England, where there are many uh, school, secondary schools in England without a physics teacher. Um, and so far, uh, we've been more or less, I think, uh, able to avoid that. We're not in the situation yet that uh, I think computer science uh, sees itself. But I think that there is definitely a, a job of work to be done, not only by the likes of the learning societies to you know, try and ensure that um, teaching is seen to be a valuable uh, uh, career um, that we attract people into it. But we are facing a situation where, um, as has been reported on you know, various sources, um, that um, job opportunities are um, uh, very good in uh, you know, the physical sciences, engineering, computing. As you've said yourself there, uh, things like the, the creative uh, gaming industry and so on, it's very sexy. Um, so these industries are attracting potential very good uh, teachers away from teaching um, and as a result um, we are concerned and we would like you know to gain better evidence on the uh, longer uh, term impact that that's likely to have on the future workforce because if we do lose um, our talented young people to other industries uh, we lose the capacity to tr train uh, the future workforce that this country will rely on to ensure that we've got a, a, a good science and technology based knowledge economy um, to ensure the country is successful in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, Siobhan McMahon. Thank you. Sure, you mentioned um, about replenishment rates uh, in your answer there. Um, I know from my own patch um, in the area I represent that some physics teachers who wish to retire have actually had to keep on because there was no one to take their place and if if they had retired, um, physics wouldn't have been offered in those schools. Do you have facts and figures on how often that's happening, given that you said you don't want to go down the route? Uh, unfortunately, England? we've only got largely anecdotal evidence. Um, okay. Again, that's one of the things that we would like to see <coughs> independent evidence for. Um, I'm sitting here today um, not teaching my National 5 higher and 2 advanced higher physics classes that I... Um, some would say ought to be teaching today. Um, it is a retired physics teacher uh, who I've managed to uh, secure who is covering my classes today. Um, that's one anecdote, but it's very typical. Okay. And I'm a little concerned as a retired physics teacher that he might get me in on this. <laughs> yes, I, I, know, I know that Ian Gray has said that he's played a small part in the history of physics teaching, but well, I can assure him he's a job I can assure, I can the assure colleagues my GTC <laughs> registration has lapsed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank goodness for small mercies, Ian. But, uh, <laughs> can I, um, uh, unfortunately, I think Mark's question has been covered uh, by his colleague Ian Gray, actually, just so you can talk about it afterwards. But um, can I come to you, Liam? I, I know you had some questions that you wanted to... Yeah, just moving on to the, uh, on to the secondary sector there. I mean, I, I think, Professor Brown, you've made very clear the support of the learning societies for the role at the Curriculum for Excellence. I think you were also right to uh, allude to the, the, the sort of cross-party consensus on this. But um, and this committee is familiar with some of the concerns that have been raised about the implementation. But I have to say I was um, uh, struck by the stridency of some of the, the concerns that were expressed in the written evidence. I think in, in, uh, uh, in, in part of the survey it refers to uh, the implementation being condemned as incoherent, amateurish and rushed, causing stress amongst teachers and pupils. Yeah. And goes on uh, in terms of the assessment requirements uh, to say this was poorly explained, inadequately implemented nationally and undermining the confidence of both staff and pupils. Now, I, I, I just want to perhaps um, tease out from you whether or not you think that teach, the teaching profession in the STEM subjects has been disproportionately impacted by the rollout of Curriculum for Excellence uh, or, or, and, and whether that impact on presumably morale, etc., um, has, uh, has been more pronounced in these areas than it has been across the board. Uh, or whether you, what you're seeing here is a reflection of in certain schools um, problems have, a, a, have emerged, uh, in others uh, less so? Well, I'm probably going to give an unsatisfactory answer because, of course, I don't know because we haven't looked at um, 
teachers in other areas. We do have, I mean, for example, the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, we've had concerns about things uh, which have been expressed in small groups in history and in geography and so on, although they're, they're not always the same kinds of things. So I think there are probably some distinctive things about STEM. I want to remind you, as, as I think we, we made clear, that the data was collected this year, uh, sorry, last year, in 2014, at a time when they were going through the National Four, National Five for the first time. Um, SQA was going through National Four, National Five for the first time. And so it would be surprising if there weren't things that made people nervous and set them on edge. However, I think probably something which has been going on for several years and which I think we're picking up is that it really is important when you're hearing from a number of different sources concerns, and sometimes these come from parents. We actually do work with, with parents' organisations as well. Things coming from parents, things coming from teachers that are really not properly dealt with. And I think that has been going on. And I suppose one of the hopes that we would have is that some attention will be paid to this. So that government, government agencies and others involved will say, well look, we are getting some systematic evidence to say that there's a concern about this area. What can be done about it? It's the feeling, I mean, I was actually rather flattered, but also rather embarrassed when I gave a talk over at Dynamic Earth. And afterwards, a teacher stood up and said, thank you for taking notice of us. And I was embarrassed um, because I shouldn't be pleased about this. I mean, it really seems to me that we have to take the concerns of parents and teachers. And to do that, we need to find the evidence. And we have done some rather small, on a world scale, pieces of inquiry. I think that for the reasons that Scotland has had a really magnificent name for education, what it should be doing is to be really looking at evidence about how things are actually going in classrooms, what's going wrong and what's going right, and building on that, particularly it has the opportunity to do that now with the increased emphasis on continuing professional development. But it has to be done systematically. I, that, I think very, very candid. I mean, I think we're getting back to the issue around um, the data that's available that I think Ian Gray was touching mm -hmm. on earlier. But uh, it's suggested in the Royal Society of Chemistry's uh, briefing here that if one looks at the, the PISA studies, for example, that um, Scotland does lag behind a number of international competitors, including Singapore, Germany, Poland, Vietnam, and Chinese regions of Shanghai and, and Hong Kong. So, I mean, there is there's some evidence there that I suppose would, would justify and, and on which um, government and, and others with a, a stake in this could found um, decisions to, to provide additional support where it, where it needed. Now, you've just talked about um, the need for, um, I suppose, a better commun communication between um, teachers and, and uh, uh, those with responsibility over, over school management and these sorts of issues. Others have suggested that in areas where there are particular problems, whether in terms of computing science or, or, or physics, that um, those are deemed sufficiently important that they get kind of key worker status and there's an, a, a, an additional supplement to try and um, retain people within the sector or, or, or recruit against um, it's a competition from the creative gaming sector or, or, or wherever it is. I mean, have you got any sense as to the sorts of things that might um, address some of those problems that have been flagged up in, in, in this report and might help address the, um, some of the, uh, the, the concerns coming out of the PISA findings? Well, I think, first of all, I think you have to be careful about interpreting international attainment data. Uh, there have been lots of reasons over the years 
why Scotland has come out better than perhaps it should or worse than perhaps it should. Mm -hmm. So I think one has to look at that very carefully and not wildly, wildly use that data. Personally, I think the way in which we have to look forward is to say, I think we'd probably all agree that we're moving into a new world in all sorts of ways. That we have a radical set of reforms that we've introduced and that which we're very pleased that people around the world accept that these are radical reforms and that we may be leading the way. But we have to look at what the implications of these reforms are. And we have to see it as a radical new approach to what happens in school. I mean, if I might give the example in um, the Curriculum for Excellence of the notion of focusing not just on effective learning, but also on responsible citizenship, also young people having confidence, developing confidence, and being able to effectively contribute to society, and then having no idea whether we're actually including that in the assessment. I mean, the SQA will say, oh, yes, well, you know, we include these sorts of things, but we don't actually know. We haven't had a study which says, you know, these things are included. We have to accept that this will take a few years. I mean, it really isn't that we are comparing this year with last year. We have to say, yes, but next year coming through, we may have quite a different approach, given that we've had the experience, when we look at what happens next year. Next year may, may have very different things. But you can't just let it go on you know, without examining what impact it's had and without saying, and what does that tell us about what we've got, got to do for the future, given that we have some very good aims and goals? So would, would it be fair to say that a, a successful outcome from your perspective, mm. from the work that's been done, would be a commitment <laughs> from um, Scottish Government to developing the... the, the the longitudinal studies or whatever it is, a mapping exercise that gives us a clearer understanding of, of what is happening uh, going forward? Well, that would, be, that would be a very important matter. I mean, <clears throat> there would, of course, be arguments and stated positions about what is the priority. I mean, it's, a, it's looking at priorities. But what I would say is that if I would put one criticism in, it's been that we have too, been too busy to assert the successes that we've had in these reforms. And when you look for the evidence for that, we don't know where it is. Okay, okay thank you very much. Uh, Siobhan. Thank you. I wanted to ask some questions about the Wood Report and the Commission for Del Developing Scotland's Young Workforce. Um, in the report, it was said, and I'll quote, tangible steps to improving the popularity of STEM education are only achieving limited success. And then it goes on. Um, the Scottish Government's response has been that employers and schools need to develop strong two-way partnerships, partnerships that deliver improvements to teaching and learning and bring real-life context into the classroom, particularly in relation to science, technology, engineering and mathematics. I was wondering, therefore, if you believe that this would bring an improvement into the funding for teaching and any tangible results that you see coming forward from um, what the government's response has been to the Commission? Well, I'm not sure that I can answer the last of those. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it seems to me that what we're... What we're at one with Wood is that we are looking for ways, um, I mean, for example, in relation to partnerships. It's a very loosely used word. Very often um, we will, I mean, we have ourselves been involved in partnerships where it's turned out that they have not been partnerships at all, but it's simply been an opportunity for other people to say, our partners, the Royal Societies or whatever it is, support us in something that we actually haven't been given any information about. 
So while in principle I think conceptually that partnerships are of course always necessary, you have to be clear about what that means. I mean, we did, in fact, have a meeting with Education Scotland not so long ago where they listed their partnerships, which went on and on and on. And we said, had they evaluated which of these they should be pursuing? And we found that actually they hadn't. And they said to us quite rightly, well, we're not a research or evaluation organisation. And indeed, that's quite right. But the trouble is, how do you decide what is going to constitute a partnership and how do you not only get people to take responsibility on both sides, partnerships are not takeovers, and how do you maintain accountability for that? <coughs> so I would say that in that, I mean others um, may, may want to put their, their bit in here, but if we're going to talk about partnerships, we have to be clear what the responsibility is and how accountability is going to be in, implied, it, it worked out. Is there any of the rest of you would like to say? Contribute? Anything? I think there's yes. certainly a need for, um, in, in terms of computing, I think there's certainly a need for um, more varied opportunities for young people. Um, what we're not, what we don't want to do is necessarily just focus on training a generation of software engineers. I think there needs to be far more varied opportunities whether it's going through FE College or going direct on to um, training schemes or working with employers. Um, so that's certainly one thing we'd like. And we've done a little bit, we started doing a little bit of research into um, what non-IT industry um, employers would require of their employees. And a lot of what they're coming out, from our initial research, a lot of what they're coming up with is actually core computational thinking skills um, of being able to see a bigger picture, being able to break a problem down, being able to model a, a solution for the, for the problems that they're seeing. Um, so what, what we'd like to be doing is, is working with Education Scotland, and in fact we, we are in discussions with them, as to ch updating our curriculum in terms of computing for broad general education, so 3 to 15, and updating that to be, include more computational thinking. Um, and, and going beyond just looking as, at computer games as a context, which is currently what, what we have in the curriculum at the moment. Okay. Dr Beveridge. Um, uh, yes, I can uh, say that from our perspective, we certainly think there's great value to be had from industry becoming involved um, and a huge contribution that industry has to make in promoting the STEM subjects and working with schools. Uh, and this programme I mentioned earlier, Chemistry at Work, is one that we fund, which we found to be very, very effective uh, in allowing people from industry to come in and share the excitement of their subject and, and their experience uh, with school pupils directly, and, and, and that is something very worthwhile. Yes, I think much, much is done um, already in, in this area. Um, I think it's very clear from the, the Wood uh, report, Recommendation 12, I think it states very clearly that STEM should be at the centre of uh, you know, the education of uh, future young, uh, our future young people. Um, I very much agree uh, with Sally's comment that um, this has to be done in a structured way uh, in partnership with other organisations. I think much of what is done at the moment is done on a, a relatively ad hoc basis and as a result uh, there is perhaps less value obtained from many of these partnership arrangements uh, than could be the case if this was done in a, a more uh, structured framework uh, where there was, um, again, follow-up with independent analysis of that and um, uh, feedback and evaluation. Um, I think um, industry... Um, Organisations like the Learning Societies have definitely got a part to play in this, but it's got to be done in, I think, a, a structured framework that maximises the, the benefit for all partners in the organisations. Totally. Yes, what I really wanted to say was that um, already in existence there's the STEM ambassador scheme, which you may well be aware of, which is where representatives from um, higher education, from research, but also from industry will come into schools and will um, you know, work alongside children in schools. And that is a tremendous way to actually raise the profile and raise awareness of working in science. And, um, and that's something to be applauded. Um, you were mentioning about funding, and I think we've got to be a wee bit careful there because, um, you know, reiterating 
what Kate was saying about the difference between training for work and what education is about. We've got to remember that there, are, that, you know, there are different agendas. Yes, part of what we're doing from an education point of view is preparing for work, but it's also the wider agenda as well of preparing for um, life in society. And the the funding side of it could actually hold us possibly to ransom if we're not careful. Just on that, then, mm -hmm. obviously, given the report that you've given us and the challenges that you foresee in the education system as it is, do you think the recommendation in the Wood report you could implement just now, given the challenges you already face? I wouldn't like directly to comment on that, actually, but I'm not sure. When you, it depends what you mean by just now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Monday <laughs> afternoon, no, no, no. <laughs> um, but over a few years. I mean, you can make a, a lot of difference over a few years. Um, but so you so. have the resources to do is what I'm, I'm getting at at the minute. Given that you've given us a challenging paper, you're setting out all the things that you think you require more support from. You're now being given another challenge by the Wood Report. The Scottish Government are endorsing it. Do you know, others are signed up to it. Can you implement it with the resources that you have? Um. You're the government. <laughs> no, I'm not. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, if I want to go back to the government and say, I should say, what? Well, we're not trying here to say that one specific thing is much more important than others or less important. What we're trying here is to, in a sense, help you by trying to lay out some of the landscape. And, of course, one can never do everything that you, <coughs> that you want to immediately. One has to have priorities. And you have to go public with the priorities and, you know, listen to the debate about it, of course. But I don't think uh, that I personally, and it's not something that we've tried to come to an agreement in, in, in our group, um, if I could just say that the main reason that our group came into existence was that the individual learned societies in the different sciences, and we include um, engineering, of course, um, although we haven't got anybody from engineering today, they would found that their societies were not perhaps having the impact on public policy that they would like to have. And they thought that if we could get together, and we've done that with this Learned Societies group, there were some general things that we might want to collaborate on and perhaps to have a slightly louder voice because we were all here. But I wouldn't want to... I mean, I would put um, a lot of support on the primary sector. <clears throat> I think that the support that the primary sector has had in the past, that the priorities that have been put on it haven't been enough. And I mean, one of the things that we have tried to do, I'm not sure whether we said this in the paper, is that we have tried to persuade the General Teaching Council um, that people going into primary education should have much better qualifications in science than they currently have. Uh, whether we will succeed on that, of course, I don't know. But that's one of the things that I would think was important. And putting that together with the kind of campaign that the Royal Society of Chemistry has at the moment is a very important thing. I think that Kate has told us of the instancy of the need and the needs to promote changes in computing studies. But I'm not in a position to give you a list of this is what I would be putting forward as the first thing for this country to take. I would simply say that these must be on the agenda somewhere. Okay, thank you. Um, Gordon MacDonald. Okay, thanks very much, Convener. And you've just turned the conversation to primary sector, and that's exactly what I want to ask you about. And I was a bit concerned when I read the report about a couple of issues that, that you've highlighted within the report. Um, the first one was under funding for science, and it was paragraph 7. And you, you stated that among those Scottish primary schools surveyed, 
a number indicated that per capita science spend in 2013-14 was nil. Can you tell us how many that number was? And for clarity, you know, um, are you able to name the schools or if you don't want to name the schools, are you able to identify whether this was widespread depending on the number involved or was it um, relating to one local authority area or what was the situation? The, the number, the number was very small. Uh, no, we're not in a position to identify the schools. Uh, when you mean very small? Them. Do you mean one or two? Or yeah, one or one or two. Yes. Right. Um, okay. uh, obviously, the the majority of schools were having some spending o on science, uh, as you can see. You know, the the average figure and indeed the maximum figure is still very small. Um, the numbers that uh, identified that they weren't spending anything was a, a very small number. Right. But when you say that they weren't spending any, anything, was that because they couldn't identify how much of their budget they were spending on science, or was it that they basically weren't teaching science at all? Um, our survey um, didn't have a question that could identify um, whether it was because they weren't teaching science or because they hadn't uh, identified any spending for it in that financial year. Um, either reason could be possible. So they could actually be teaching science, but you know, if they're going to Dynamic Earth or uh, Glasgow Science Museum, they're registering as trips rather than science. Perhaps again, we don't have evidence for that. Again, it's the sort of thing that we would like to see more independent evidence and, uh, and information gathered. But our sur survey uh, wasn't able to identify that level of detail. Right. Okay. And the, the second concern for me was uh, just just yeah. small I, I, I have to say this this jumped out at me as well. Do you think it's likely that any primary school in Scotland isn't teaching any science at all? <coughs> Sorry, Dr. Oh. Um, I think we've got to be very careful with this one, um, because we haven't got any independent evidence either way. But anecdotally, um, I see students in, in, in primary schools as part of my job, and um, there, it seems to be some sort of lottery as to whether or not the amount of science that's being done, depending upon the expertise within the school. So I think that's something that we do need to have some more information about. I would accept would that. I, th that. I think the, the question, I'm, I'm, really, I'm sure this is the reason Gordon's asked it, but also the reason that it jumped out at me was that it says that, you know, a, a number, it turns out it's one or two, mm. but a, a number, the spend was nil, which seemed to me more likely to be an anomaly in the survey than an, than an actual fact that, that, that there are primary schools in Scotland where no science at all is being taught. It may just be that it's there, not identified as, as, a, yeah. as a budget spend. I think there, there are degrees of what different people would identify as science. For instance, uh, one of the concerns, and again, part of the reason, I think, why the, the, the Royal Society of Chemistry um, is um, supporting their campaign for a science specialist um, is to ensure... Um, that the quality of science experience in our primary schools is a good one. Uh, again, we don't have detailed uh, evidence within this group, but anecdotally, you could uh, identify that in some schools, for instance, a teacher might be doing a science topic about the solar system and the universe, and basically the activity would be uh, out of paper mache around balloons creating um, uh, models of the different planets uh, in the solar system. Now, um, that could be a very basic activity, which is essentially just a craft art activity where you paint uh, balloons different colours to represent the different planets, without there being any of the deeper uh, activities going on where uh, work is done on the scale of the universe, where uh, you know the mathematics um, behind the relative sizes and distances are explored, or that um, there is... A, a, what I would recognise as scientific um, uh, you know, activity going on with that activity. However, that could still be interpreted and you know, uh, uh, identified within a, a teacher's work plan as a science-based activity. So it's very difficult, um, without doing some good quality uh, research into identifying the in a bit more detail what the specifics of the activities are to identify the quality of the science activity going on in many of our schools. Okay, thank you. Sorry, God. Okay, that's fine. Thanks, convener. Um, as I was going on to say about my, my second concern was paragraph 12 of your report, which looks at classroom facilities, health and safety, and outdoor space. 
it says 45% of primary schools report having no access to safety equipment. <coughs> I mean, you know, there is obviously health and safety regulations that, that take place. Are, are, we, are we saying that schools are teaching uh, science and ignoring health and safety and therefore putting pupils in danger? Or are we saying that there is no practical science uh, lessons taking place? I mean, what is it? Because that's quite a substantial number, albeit it's a small sample size of 2%. Personally, uh, I, of all the outcomes from the survey work that we did, uh, I think largely most of the outcomes uh, that were reported were broadly in line with my own personal expectations. Mm -hmm. That was the one that I did not expect. Um, I personally am quite alarmed by the fact that so many uh, primary teachers seem to be quite forthcoming uh, to uh, admit the fact that they didn't have adequate health and safety um, uh, or access to that, uh, that is certainly an issue that I think ought to be followed up with more investigative work. Um, again, the survey didn't go into sufficient details to indicate that as a result of not having any access, they were um, not doing anything or they were just doing things without access to the appropriate health and safety advice. But I mean, that's quite a serious accusation. I mean, there is the potential there for pupils to be put at risk. Yeah. So we, we, if, if what you're saying is of that 39 schools that you surveyed, that roughly 17 or 80 of them, 18 of them, roughly 45%, have these genuine concerns, then I think it's, there's a duty on you to actually inform us in writing of those schools because we would then have to address local authorities because we can't have a situation where you are highlighting to us that there is serious concerns that schools do not have access to safety equipment and we sit here as a committee and do nothing about it. We are reporting what has been reported to us by teachers and yes, um, it's and something we that... We assure them of anonymity. But surely when health... And you're, you are claiming that there is... There no, is we're not a, claiming. The teachers are claiming. Right, OK, but your report is claiming well, the that there is... Claiming. There is a 45% of primary schools, albeit a very small sample size, have no access to safety equipment. That's a very, you know... I think, I think I still have to challenge you on who is claiming what, because we have no val validity established about this. All we are saying is that 45% of the responses from mm -hmm. primary schools said that. we have assured them that they will remain anonymous. Uh, I, th I think as well, we've got to remember that the teachers are only answering the question that was yes, put to them. And the question that was put to them is, do you have... Uh, I mean, I, I can't... We'd have to check with the exact wording of the question, but basically they were being asked, do you have specific science uh, safety equipment? You can do lots of wonderful hands-on science in a primary school without requiring um, some safety equipment. So in no way... Would a teacher who'd answered this necessarily be kind of admitting that in any way they had put any pupil at risk whatsoever? Right. But given what you said earlier on, that there are so few teachers in primary school that have a science background, how would they be in a position to know whether they had the correct science equipment in place for health and safety reasons, if they've got no background in science? Well, I regret that our... Our research was not so sophisticated that we have an answer to that. Can I just come in at this point? Um, I think it, the, if we dig deeper into what it's actually stating in this bullet point, the examples that are given are tongs, heat mats, and goggles, and sand trays. Of those, sand trays are the ones that I would expect to see in a primary school. I wouldn't necessarily expect to see tongs, heat mats and goggles, merely because the practicals that they would be doing wouldn't necessarily imply that they would use them anyway. So I think what's coming out here is perhaps a misunderstanding um, on um, uh, the type of practicals that these, these mm. teachers would be using and don't necessarily assume that they're actually doing them. Um, that's giving us a slightly different story, I think. OK, thanks so much. Just, just to confirm then, of course, what we're, we're not saying that the primary schools are necessarily inhibited in from carrying out the lessons that we want them to, to do because of a lack of safety equipment. 
Is that is that what you're seeing? Yeah, I, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily expect them to have tongs, heat mats, and goggles. No, neither would so I. Therefore, yeah, yeah, so therefore that they can still carry out, like, like um, you're saying, they can still carry out a range of, of um, wonderful experiments. In fact, I would advocate that they would do rather than trying to go down this route of is using it, is, tongs. And no, indeed. Yeah. So, yeah. Is, yeah. But they, they, they don't know. Yeah. No. Now, is it possible then this was a, a perhaps a misunderstanding by Quite the respondents? Possibly, but I'm we not, don't, I'm not yeah. saying that it is, I'm just mm. wondering. Yeah. Right, okay. Sorry, I know Lee MacArthur wanted a supplementary. Um, perhaps just touched on listening to the exchanges there, both about the safety equipment, um, but also about the explanation of, of, of how you could um, uh, have a, a project involving the solar system that could be, um, at the one end, simply an arts and crafts exercise, at the other end, one with so, some level of, of scientific input. It, it seems to underscore the importance of having at least somebody within the school who can give you the, the scientific or give other colleagues the, the, the confidence that there is a scientific input uh, in there and, and, and that would seem to be the conclusion I would draw from, from, from both those uh, par paragraphs. I think, and that's reinforcing what Professor Brown said earlier on about raising the entry level to um, initial teacher education for primary um, for primary potential teachers. Is it is it realistic to do this across the board? I mean, I've had conversation with, um, with with some colleagues about this in the past. I mean, obviously, the constituency I represent in, in Orkney has a number of very, very small primary schools. And in mm. a sense, probably what you're looking at uh, there is, is somebody who perhaps has a role yeah. that spans and that, um, that's numerous where I think, primary yeah, schools. Still, yes, the, the, this, is, um, the, the, this is one area where there's complete uh, kind of... Uh, Agreement across the board because the evidence is very, very strong, both from Education Scotland 3 to 18 report, from our PITE survey, that, that a, a prime issue is the access uh, to somebody in a school or access to someone in a neighbouring school, and that's a very important point, who has the confidence uh, to be able to address science teaching and advise others on science teaching in primaries. Uh, you're, you're quite right. Um, Scotland has uh, almost 11,000 um, schools that have a school role of less than 50. So in our campaign, what we're advocating is that there should be um, science subject leaders, people who are confident uh, in science. And for that, we're looking at someone who might have a science degree background, but actually all we're recommending from the wrong side of chemistry is a science hire or equivalent training that they've picked up during initial teacher uh, training education or experience from uh, a, a, an extensive career uh, to be able to advise others in their own school or in more rural areas where we have small schools would be on, on hand to be able to advise people in neighbouring schools uh, on, on science issues. But, but again, we, we presumably need to know where we are at the current time and as I understand it, the, the statistics around what that what that profile is across the current um, teacher population is is not necessarily that robust. No, we've we've um, tried we've tried hard um, to try and assess the, the how many teachers might already have a science hire or how many teachers are entering the profession with uh, these qualifications. But these are statistics we haven't been able to to obtain, uh, and these are something very very much we would welcome um, any kind of initiative to try and pin down uh, harder figures on. Thank you. I, Thank you. Just, just before I bring you in, yes. I just want to just check something. I, I may have misheard, but Dr. Beveridge, did you see that there are 11,000 schools in Scotland with a, a role of less than 50? Uh, close to 11,000. Is that right? Uh, oh, 1,100 maybe? Oh, it could be 1,100. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, 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 I would check your maths, Dr. And numeracy is important <laughs> as well, I think. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll double-check that. Um, <laughs> yeah. It didn't sound right. There. Sorry, Professor Brown. Well, I just wanted to make the point that, you know, when you're, when you're talking about something like this and how we might be able to get the science expertise that we need into schools, is just to remind you of the foreign languages developments in the 90s when we had a number of different kinds of models that you could use, some of which involved... Um, developing the modern languages skills of primary teachers or of some primary teachers or bringing secondary teachers in. And it seems to me that that's the sort of thing that we might be looking for, um, just exploring what different models could provide in, in relation to science in primary schools. Can I, can I, 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 I agree, but I'm, I'm wondering whether 
what your view is then, because the the government, I mean, I'm looking at a report that was in uh, the Herald um, about this issue that we're discussing today, um, and your report. Uh, the government's quoted there, it's, 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 and it's something that came up in the debate last week that uh, Ian Gray had on this subject. I'll quote you from the government spokesman. It says, we provide direct funding of £900,000 per annum to the Scottish Schools Education Research Centre. Now, that's the, the purpose of that is to actually try and support teachers and increase their confidence levels in the very areas, that I think, in science areas that mm -hmm. you've been talking about. And also, um, they go on to talk about the um, Education Scotland is developing a national STEM uh, project. Uh, and that will be, I think it's been piloted, and then is it the intention is to roll that out. Isn't, isn't that what you're just calling for? Is that actually well, beginning let, to happen? Let me say that in relation to CERC, which was the first point yes, that uh -huh. you made, um, CERC is a very effective organisation. It's been around for some time. Um, and one of, the f one of the really good functions that it fulfils is it has an independent evaluation which shows how good its work is. Um, it does suffer in the sense that it can't expand enough. I mean, that's just a, re a resources question. But I would say that that is a model that has shown itself to be very good indeed. And it would be great if it could be extended um, across um, the whole country um, as more I effectively. As I understand it, the, the, that, that £900,000 the CERC project that we're talking about oh. operate, operates in about half of the authorities. Um, yes. Yes. About 16 authorities. I think it's 15 of the, the 32 16, authorities. 15, however, 16, however yeah. I, I would qualify that slightly by the fact that within each local authority that may just be say one cluster of primary schools so you know it may be a, a very small fraction of the primary schools in a particular exactly. authority so there there are issues of scale uh, involved in the project okay. the second point that you made about education scotland well i'm I, actually i don't know anything about that particular development at least not in not in enough detail to to really comment on it. I don't know whether anybody else knows enough about it. It's currently operating in four local authorities and the intention is once it's... I'm using, I'm using the word pilot. They don't say pilot, but I assume that's <laughs> what's going on. It will then, to then roll out uh, further across the country. Well, if it does the job. <laughs> I, mean, I, well, I was asking you, but obviously you maybe don't no, have enough afraid de detail I don't at this know. stage. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm aware that it's taking place and that which four local authorities that's involved with, but uh, again, I don't think we've got any evidence of right, that. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Sorry, uh, Mary. Um, I've just got some brief questions. Uh, given that uh, mathematical skills have been highlighted in the, the last exchange, <laughs> um, we're not going to let you forget that one. <laughs> Uh, we've not actually said much about maths today. I'm not sure who's speaking up for maths. I think Kate did very well in terms of uh, computing. But uh, would you say that uh, mathematics, the teaching of mathematics is a priority in schools? And I did highlight there's been increased presentations for higher and advanced higher. Would, in, in the grand scheme of things, is that a priority? Yes. Yes. Uh, would you be concerned, as I am then, that uh, although there's been a fall in the number of teachers for various disciplines in science, the highest fall that I have in front of me today, which may not be totally complete, but the most significant fall in teachers is mathematics. Between 2009 and 14, we have 314 fewer maths teachers. So... That hasn't been covered today. Should that be a priority? Why is it happening? And does it give you cause for concern? Well, this is an off-the-cuff answer to you because we actually don't have mathematics in our group of learned societies. Oh, dear, dear. But we are... <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's something that needs to be corrected. Well, yeah. maybe it is. Yeah. Maybe it is. We have to take that back. OK. Um, but... Am I personally concerned? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Um, is maths worse than computing in terms of the loss, proportionately? Yeah. Um, another stage of I, I was yes. just going to pick up on what was being said about the, the um, importance and significance of maths. Yes, there is concern right there mm. across the board. Yeah. And remember STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, maths. Mm. I mean, it is part of the whole STEM agenda. Yeah. Um, but it's the application of maths. 
and um, it's the interdisciplinary side of it yes. all where yeah. it all does interweave and I think that's what, what we need to remember so although we don't have a representative within the the learning societies groups from from a maths organization <clears throat> excuse me it is applied throughout all of the subject areas that we look at and that's um, and so it's not just a case of teaching the subjects it's it's looking at how it is yes. used within the various disciplines as yes. well yes uh, thank you for putting that on the record. Uh, my, my second point is really, um, to what extent do schools, and we are talking about partnerships this morning, you know, uh, schools have links with universities, colleges, industry. You know, it, we've talked about uh, Gordon MacDonald talking about shortage of equipment, etc. You know, uh, are there partnerships to utilise uh, the science and teaching Equipment, for example, do businesses and universities donate science equipment to to schools? Um, you know, is that a partnership worth uh, developing further in order to look at better utilisation of the equipment that is out there? Well, if you look, University Scotland have actually, um, you know, published um, some things on this, and there is a really quite extensive, although not systematic pattern of partnerships. I mean, if I could take an example, Harriet Watt University have for many years had um, very close partnerships with schools in um, engineering and physical science and mathematics and so on. There are certainly cases where I'm not sure whether um, equipment is given, but equipment is often lent and young people in schools go into universities sometimes to use their, their facilities. Of course, you're likely to benefit much more if you're a school in the central region than you are if you're out in some, some rural place. But um, UHI has also done this with its college um, uh, structure um, around the more rural parts of the country. And I think one of the big questions is how you can extend this to all of the schools, either by getting young people travelling in to other institutions or what happens probably more often, people from the higher education institutions travelling out. This follows on to the point that I made earlier about a lot of the partnership um, initiatives are, are ad hoc in nature. Um, and... Um, I think that as a nation, uh, we ought to, uh, I think, look uh, at being uh, more clever in terms of how we develop partnerships, and particularly for the, for the benefit of all. Um, you know, it, it, we, we should be looking to have some provision that uh, in outlying rural areas uh, that our young people have the same opportunities as those that you know live down the, the, the road from a, a, a higher education uh, uh, institute. Um, so it's, I think looking at it in a, yeah. in a systematic, system-wide way... Well, I'm pleased to hear that, given that I have an MSP for the Highlands and yeah. Islands. <laughs> And my final question, um, which hasn't been covered today, convener, uh, but we've talked about spending and you've also mentioned about the autonomy of local authorities, um, etc. Uh, in your brief, uh, page two, you say that uh, in primary schools, the per capita spend is around 162 in Scotland and 289 in England. For secondary schools, 2013-14, you've got 730 three for Scotland, and the figure for England is two years earlier, but it's uh, still greater, it's still three pounds more. Now, is the spending per pupil, is that the main issue? Are the outcomes in England so much better? Uh, you know, what is the result of this uh, higher spending per capita? And, you know, is that the main issue we're looking at today? Well, it I, doesn't always have to be no, Sally, no, no. I can see um, her think, You know, she's worked very hard yeah, this think, morning. Think, <laughs> Maybe someone think, else could give her a yes. break. Um, I, I think, again, that there um, are issues that we don't have much direct evidence of that. As well, we've you already have mentioned... you these figures. These are well, your figures. Oh, yes. No, no, no. no. I, 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 that, that we've got the evidence for the figures. Okay. And, and, and part of the reason why okay. the Learning Societies Group... Uh, wanted to conduct this research into yeah. resourcing yeah. was because the equivalent 
uh, group uh, based down in, in London, SCORE, the yeah. science community representing uh, education, had conducted this other survey in England. And um, the, the Learned Society's uh, you know, headquarters uh, down in the London area um, saw fit uh, to support the Learned Society's group uh, to conduct a similar survey for Scotland, because they were in, you know, we were interested in finding the comparison. Um, again, we've conducted that, that uh, study. We're presenting the outcomes. Um, obviously, the uh, engagement of um, Scotland in international studies is one of the main ways in which comparisons between uh, different countries are made. Um, as has already been mentioned, you know, there was withdrawal from TIMS, which was the main study looking at uh, upper primary, lower secondary um, comparisons uh, between Scotland and England. Uh, so we basically do not have any independent evidence on which to make a comparison. So although you've got the figure, you haven't got the result of yeah. that figure in terms of passes yeah. or employability. I think one of the, the historically one of the differences between England and Scotland was that since the introduction of the national curriculum uh, in England in the late 1980s, uh, science along with mathematics and English were one of the three core subjects. And that has given a greater status, prominence to science within the curriculum in England than it okay. has enjoyed in Scotland. Okay. And I think, you know, there are some consequences, you know, perhaps unintended consequences that have occurred over uh, the last couple of decades or so um, that um, in England science has enjoyed uh, greater status within their curriculum than it has in Scotland. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you'd be pleased to know I've got one final <laughs> question. Um, you, you, it's been very good of you. It's gone on longer than I anticipated, but I'm sure that's a good thing. Um, you mentioned earlier on... Professor Brown about, um, obviously, one of the underlying themes here is about um, building a better evidence base, reviewing th what's going on. Uh, are you aware that the OECD is reviewing Curriculum for Excellence this year? Um, yes, you're, indeed I, we are. I, and if you're aware, are, are you involved in that in any way? I mean, are, and are you reassured <laughs> by that review in any way? Well, um, it, it is a review. It mm. isn't an evaluation, no. is the first thing. And, yes, we are... Um, we are described by the government as a partner in that. Although um, that hasn't worked out terribly well so far, but they are coming twice. Mm -hmm. They're coming in February, um, and I'm now talking, actually, I've realised, not from the Learned Societies group. I'm talking as uh, from the Royal Society of Edinburgh. But... We are expecting um, that the Learned Societies Group will have an input to this, but the real collection of evidence will come in June. And then, um, I just forget when the publication of the report is, but my guess is the end of, of this current year. Um, the way in which this is organized is that the there is a very ambitious background paper which is being put together by the Scottish government and we have had the chance to comment on an early draft of that um, which we have done um, uh, we don't know what impact we'll have on that but we will find out uh, by the time we meet the OECD uh, next month um, so if you ask us in a couple of months' time, we might have more to say, but we'll really have to wait to the end of the year before okay. we know. So thank you. Is the December 2015, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Can I thank all of you for coming along this morning? It's been a, almost an hour and three quarters, so that was a, 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 a decent crack at it. So thank you very much for indulging us this morning and bringing uh, not only your written evidence, but also yourselves along to give us oral evidence here today. We very much appreciate uh, your, your time and effort today, so thank, thank you very much. Um, we previously agreed to take our next item in private, so I therefore close the meeting to the public.